Hello everyone, welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course Postmodernism in Literature. In uh, today's session, we continue to look at some of the critiques against postmodernism. In the previous session itself, we started locating some of the ways in which postmodernism has been extremely criticized, particularly from the Marxist perspective. And two, there has been a number of ways in which postmodernism has been dismissed, a number of ways in which many contemporary theorists and uh, cr critical writers have considered this as one of the bogus theories of the uh, um, uh, of the contemporary, which relies heavily on uh, capitalism and does not really explore anything in depth or engage with any meaningful uh, uh, activity. And, and some of the uh, common concerns in that uh, sense has been that postmodern theory has no sense of agency, no theory of agency, no strategy of resistance and absolutely no way to transform the structures of meaning that it so brilliantly exposes and critiques. For example, uh, a number of theorists such as Barth and Foucault and also Baudria and uh, Lyota, they all have argued against the impossibility or they have rejected the notions of say for example, the text or the reality and meta narratives. But at the same time, as a corollary to this rejection, they have not given alternative structures on which uh, meaning making process can rest. On the contrary, they have uh, they've entirely rejected not just the modernist notion of engaging with reality and enlightenment and ideas of reason, they have also rejected the possibility of any meaning making process at all in the contemporary. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, uh, one of the uh, most uh, 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 pressing critiques against postmodernism is that there are no conclusions about anything, we only have an interpretation of everything. So, uh, it, it also leads us to a certain ompa in uh, multiple ways in terms of uh, methodology, in terms of disciplinary concerns and also in terms of analyzing anything that we have in the contemporary as a text. Some are also of the opinion that postmodernism has eventually boiled down to a essentially a rule breaking activity because it also challenges all kinds of ideas about truth, about uh, beauty, about uh, the notions about good, notions about uh, welfare, notions about uh, humanity as well. And um, though there have been sporadic ways in which postmodernism has been uh, critically engaged with we can say that the sustained, the most sustained form of criticism has come from the Marxist perspective, which is uh, what we have al already started looking at in the previous session. Uh, so, in, uh, continu in continuation with our discussion of Jameson, who also argued that there are three major features of postmodernism that uh, totally unsettles the uh, notions and totally unsettles any possibility of a critical uh, process or any possibility of a uh, political uh, criticism in the contemporary. And he particularly talks about emergence of a new kind of depthlessness and uh, how the role of photography and the uh, uh, photographic negative has been assisting this uh, uh, depthlessness and how a waning of effect can be located in the postmodern culture. And this we have already seen that he uh, expresses these uh, things in detail in his uh, seminal work Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. And uh, while talking about the idea of deathlessness, he gives an example by uh, comparing uh, Andy Warhol's work with a modernist, uh, with a typical modernist painting, Vincent Van Gogh's uh, A Pair of Shoes. And he also talks about how there is a way in which Vincent Van Gogh gives us a representation of shoes, which is not really about shoes, but which also is an insight into uh, certain working class lifestyles and also about uh, uh, different forms of agrarian activities. And on the contrary, Andy Warhol's uh, painting of shoes, digital painting, painting of shoes, it does not have the capability to hide anything behind it and in that sense it does not uncover or lead us towards any other uh, a, a process of criticism, towards any other kind of insight. And this essentially Jameson argues is also one of the fatalities, one of the uh, eventualities of the uh, postmodern capitalist culture. Many of the things that postmodernism talks about, Jameson argues it is also the result of a capitalist a commercialist ideology in which the human beings have been transformed into mere consumers without any sense of agency. When he talks about the third feature, particularly the waning of effect in postmodern culture, he again gives uh, two uh, comparative examples. One is a painting uh, titled The Scream by Edward Munch. Edward Munch was a Norwegian painter and this uh, painting was published in this painting was presented in 1893. 
And as a corollary, as a uh, as a contrary example, he also uh, again gives Andy Warhol's digital painting of Marilyn Monroe, which has also become a cultural uh, icon in the 20th century. And uh, here, one of the things that Jameson uh, seeks to do is to identify the refusal of postmodernism to critically engage with the meta narratives of capitalization and globalization. Even when postmodernism inherently talks about a rejection of meta narratives, a rejection of all kinds of grand narratives. Jameson argues that Jameson rather complains that they are uh, the the postmodernists and the idea of the postmodern in general they are also inherently affected with the refusal to engage with the meta narratives of globalization and uh, capitalization. So uh, here, uh, capitalism and different forms of globalization they are also seen as meta narratives, which Jameson argues has not really fallen under the purview of the postmodern critics. And this sort of a compliance with prevalent domination and exploitation is something that the Marxist critic within uh, Jameson is extremely uncomfortable with. And here when Jameson talks about the comparison between the painting Scream and the digital painting presented by Andy Warhol of Marilyn Monroe, there are particular things that he highlights. He talks about how anxiety and alienation, which the painting the Scream very uh, appropriately represents, uh, it, it, they, they, those sort of emotions have become inappropriate to the postmodern world because it's also inherently a capitalist uh, globalized commercial world and uh, he asks this very pertinent question where does one situate the canonical experiences of solitude of private revolt and such private emotional experiences in the postmodern world because uh, as in uh, when we look at the many kinds of representations that come out uh, from uh, in terms of postmodern art in terms of postmodern culture there's also an inability associated with those sites, with those uh, kinds of representations to talk about these uh, private emotions which are also articulations of revolt and revolution. And uh, this, Jameson argues, is perhaps a result of the pronouncement of the death of the subject itself which he considers as extremely fatal. And Munch's painting in Jameson's uh, Marxist perspective, it's a complex reflection of this uh, complicated situation. And such complexities, even if they exist in the postmodern world, just by virtue of privileging the postmodernist ideals, there is an impossibility to engage with this sort of a complex reflection or to engage with such a, complex, uh, such a complicated situation. He sums up the argument and uh, here I quote his own words. Postmodernism presumably signals the end of this dilemma. This dilemma which uh, was uh, inherently a part of the early modernist and the late modernist period where they could talk about issues related to individuality, issues related to anxiety and also about existential angst which it replaces with a new one. And uh, this replacement which happens in the postmodern period is something that the post uh, is something that the Marxist critics are uncomfortable with because this replacement is also a product of the globalized uh, uh, capitalist world and um, uh, uh, moving on he uh, talks about different ways in which this moving away from anxiety is not necessarily a productive experience in the postmodern world and he also talks about how the waning of effect however might also have been characterized in the narrow context of literary criticism as a waning of the high modernist thematics of time and temporality and here you know he also is also bringing in the elements of literary criticism to talk about how in the postmodern world literary criticism also suffers from a waning of effect and there is a, a degradation that uh, he begins to locate in these different ideas of culture in these different ideas of critiquing uh, uh, of culture and literature and uh, he then draws our attention to how we now inhabit the synchronic rather than the diachronic and this is a key element that we need to engage with in the context of the postmodern uh, criticism. Synchronic and diachronic are two terms that uh, he uses from the context of the linguistic analysis and these are also uh, complementary viewpoints and uh, but they uh, differ in one central aspect which James also uses to talk about the crisis in the postmodern period. Synchronic Synchronic talks about describing language at a specific point or a specific moment in time and here significantly it is frozen in time there is no engagement with history.
It's talking about an approach which is looking at particular moments in history, particular time in history without taking into account the history of that particular moment. On the contrary, diachronic refers to development and evolution of language, development and evolution of language through history. So, the distinctive determinants over here are the presence and absence of history and this is also one of the central things that makes postmodernism extremely incompatible with Marxist critical theories. And uh, uh, Jameson argues that in the contemporary we are being forced to live a life that is synchronic rather than the diachronic life which the Marxist uh, critiques uh, uh, endorse and also uh, gives us a possibility of engaging with history in which he lies the possibility of engaging with and the possibility of uh, critiquing capitalist culture itself. The moment the culture becomes synchronic in nature, the moment we begin to talk about specific moments in history to which no kind of historical accounts are associated, then we also lack the possibility, we lack the opportunity of critiquing that uh, kind of a culture. So, this experience Jameson identifies with the human beings identifying themselves as consumers and focusing on how we play rather than worrying about the real big problems which are part of late capitalism. And uh, significantly, the most of the Marxist critics are in agreement with this uh, fact that postmodernism is also one of the many representations of this uh, capitalist society. So, what does Jameson really suggest through these discussions? He is perhaps seeking to recover concepts such as dominance which are also central in talking about various Marxist uh, concepts and he is also uh, proposing to study postmodernism as a result of capitalism's rise to maturity and in that sense it is also important to remember that the Marxists also associate post-structuralism as symptomatic to capitalism. These sort of uh, moves Jameson also suggests that are important to uh, revive Marxist criticism because Marxist criticism perhaps can be posited, can be projected as a viable and effective method of critiquing globalized consumer culture and ideology. And I repeat, in the postmodern scenario, with the plethora of the postmodern theories and frameworks available, we actually lose the possibility, lose the opportunity to propose critiques against the globalized consumer culture and ideology. As and when we propose to continue a discussion of postmodern critiques by focusing next on uh, Terry Eagleton's uh, works, and it is also important to see how Terry Eagleton, particularly in his work Beginning Theory, he begins to unpack postmodernism. He first of all talk about the absolute uh, uh, negation of postmodernism with respect to meaning and the undefinability and uh, the uh, uh, lack of unity and lack of coherence associated with postmodernism and goes on to talk about postmodernism in a rather cynical way. He uh, argues that, Terry Eagleton argues that uh, postmodernism promises to cover everything from Madonna to meta narrative, from uh, postfordism to pu pulp fiction and it threatens thereby to collapse into meaninglessness. And this idea of meaninglessness uh, can be uh, read in continuation with uh, Jameson's uh, uh, argument that postmodernism is about deathlessness. So, uh, Terry Eagleton uh, introduces postmodernism as a form of culture that corresponds to postmodernity, which, uh, which he says is signaled by the end of modernity and in that sense by extension, thereby characterizing everything that is associated with modern thought from enlightenment onwards. Perhaps the prime reason, the primary reason of discomfort of Marxists against postmodernism is that they challenge all kinds of meta narratives that emerged from the enlightenment period onwards and Marxism is certainly one of the most dominant forms of meta narrative which emerged during that historical period. And it is important to engage with some of the particular things that Terry Eagleton talks about. It's also, it also runs in uh, runs a parallel to some of Jameson's arguments. It also sums up the uh, totality of Marxist criticisms against uh, postmodernism. Just like uh, Jameson Eagleton is also uncomfortable with postmodernism's impatience with conventional aesthetic judgments and also the refusal to accept or respect value distinctions between uh, say the sonnet and the soap opera. And this uh, modernist uh, uh, breaking down of all kinds of distinctions is something Jameson also had drawn her attention to. And uh, Jameson on the contrary is also drawing her attention to certain aspects of reality that cannot be refused or cannot be broken down or cannot be refused. And he is saying uh, 
that it may be possible to ignore phenomenology or semiotics or even reception theory. And he's also saying that maybe half of the world does not even know that these sort of ideas and these sort of discussions exist, but it's not possible to ignore and it is not possible to uh, negate elements such as consumerism, mass media, aestheticized uh, politics or sexual difference, which are also a part of the realities of uh, a number of people. And uh, this uh, uh, rejection of truth or identity, totality, universality, foundations, meta-narrative, and the collective revolutionary subject, all of these things which the postmodernists very com comfortably and conveniently reject and oppose and negate, Eagleton says, this sort of an approach, it goes hand in hand with the defense of a status quo. Because according to him and many other Marxist uh, critics, these sort of rejections, the rejection of truth, the rejection of reality, and the rejection of all kinds of meta-narratives in the post-enlightenment period, these are only luxuries that many cannot afford. And uh, he is here uh, posting a different kind of a reality, which is also foundational to the understanding of Marxism and the many concepts and theories and ideologies that it had put forward. And taking off from there, Eagleton also talks about certain consequences, certain fatal consequences that are associated with kind of a total rejection. To quote his own words, if the idea of system or totality can be discredited, then there is really no such thing as patriarchy or the capitalist system to be criticized. He is talking about a certain kind of a, uh, a world where when we begin to reject all kinds of uh, meta-narratives, it is also taking away the opportunity or the possibility to critique and certain existing real derogatory practices such as patriarchy or the capitalist system. Because the moment we begin to deny the existence of say patriarchy or the capitalist system, it is also a kind of a, uh, it is also a way in which we are bailing out all of these systems out of any kind of scrutiny, any kind of political criticism. In that sense also, uh, Eagleton also sees the absence of history as a root of most of these problems because postmodern theories are not really based in historical developments. And uh, he is also of the argument that postmodernists are wrong in characterizing all post-enlightenment philosophy as having a naive view of the self as prior to social context. And this, like Jameson, he also uh, thinks that this sort of an approach would only aid the promotion, the development and the emergence of uh, 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 capitalist structures as a totalitarian regime. Even while we are tempted to agree with some of the postulations that are being posited by the Marxist critics, we cannot entirely agree with them because there are certain inherent dangers within the Marxist philosophy, within the Marxist conceptual framework as well. One is only too aware of the Eurocentric uh, patriarchy in Marxism, which has been heavily critiqued, especially in the, uh, from the middle of the 20th century onwards. And also Marxism as a project, Marxism as a, as an, uh, as a force of enlightenment, as a means of empowerment, as a means of liberation. It has also failed to consider the categories of identity and difference marginalized by European post-enlightenment traditions. If uh, we uh, try to think of some such categories, maybe the foremost uh, ones would be gender, ethnicity, uh, nationality and uh, sexual preferences. So in that sense, Marxism as a meta-narrative has failed and uh, there are a number of ways in which we can support that argument as well. But when Marxist critics, when they line up against the postmodern theories, when they talk in defense of the meta-narratives, because it is also a way in which you can uh, rescue culture, you can emancipate culture from the clutches of uh, uh, say globalization. One is also, one also needs to be aware of the dangers inherent in the meta-narratives of Marxism. There are too many examples that uh, if, uh, we can cite. If you look around, you may particularly recall uh, Jameson's Eurocentricism, which was rejected by Ajaz Ahmed, another uh, fellow Marxist critic, because uh, Jameson had uh, used the term uh, third world to talk about certain countries in a way that the Marxist uh, critics such as Eja Samuel did not agree with. So um, even, while we, uh, even uh, while we are sympathetic to certain arguments that uh, Marxist critics put forward, one also needs to be um, very well aware of the inadequacy of the Marxist uh, theory in engaging with the theory of human difference. And uh, here perhaps lies the uh, value of postmodern approaches because they also give us certain tools to engage with certain tools to expose what is inherently problematic about the meta-narratives which has been uh, hitherto surviving without any sort of uh, criticisms. To some of the Marxist responses to the postmodern uh, could be seen in two ways. 
first of all to treat postmodernism as a species of political and cultural conservatism of little or no analytical political consequence and this in fact is also a very useful tool for Marxism because it would help keep in, in, intact the emancipatory potential of modernity and Marxism. At some level keeping intact the ideals of modernity keeping intact the ideals of post enlightenment period is very central to the uh, preservation of Marxism as well because the moment po postmodern theories are used against Marxism it completely negates the possibility of any kind of uh, such uh, any kind of emancipatory potential existing within frameworks such as Marxism. Certain critics such as uh, Peter Critchley, they also have a different sort of uh, uh, thing in the offing, especially in the context of postmodernism and uh, uh, Marxism. And he is also talking about a, a revision which is needed within Marxist theory by accepting that historical materialism needs to be subject uh, to, the, uh, to the broadening of perspectives. And he argues that this sort of an approach by accepting uh, uh, certain kinds of limitations within historical materialism there is a possibility that one can be led to a certain kind of a post Marxism and this is very important because that is also predicated on an avalanche of historical mutations and a whole series of positive new phenomena and this sort of an association this sort of a revision within uh, Marxism uh, Peter Critchley argues it has a more fruitful relation and it can also focus on the creation of a new society beyond modernity. Because if the Marxist critics have a problem with postmodernism moving away from modernity, then maybe it is high time that the Marxists also think about engaging with the society which has moved beyond modernity. And, once, uh, uh, and, and if there is a failure to engage with the society or certain kinds of societies and certain kinds of subject positions which have moved away from the ideas of modernity, and if one fails to engage with tho those sort of systems and those sort of individuals, maybe there is an inherent problem in transforming or in reviving those uh, tenets which were originally part of uh, modernity, for example, Marxism. And uh, Peter Critchley also gives a more viable solution to the Marxist critics rather than being totally dismissive of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, postmodern tendencies and all kinds of postmodern worldviews and theoretical frameworks. Maybe it is important to identify and repudiate those postmodern tendencies which reject the universal values of Marxism and uh, 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 critics like Peter Critchley they see still see certain inherent uh, values in the Marxist criticism and they also feel that maybe in the uh, postmodern world what is needed is a post Marxist thinking a post Marxist thinking which can also engage with societies which have moved beyond modernity. There have been other forms of criticisms as well against uh, uh, postmodernism. The most important one uh, being leveled by uh, Noam Chomsky, who also argued that postmodernism has perhaps only the potential to encourage more relativism and deviant behavior, which uh, he uh, he argues that essentially may not uh, lead to any good. And there are also certain others such as uh, Christopher Hitchens, Richard uh, Hawkins for clear and meaningful answers which according to them the postmodern critics do not offer. And there are certain specific quarrels particularly against uh, Lyotard's idea about the collapse of grand narratives and because uh, some critics are also of the opinion that the moment Lyotard proposes this idea against uh, grand narratives or proposes this idea which uh, uh, foregrounds the rejection, the refusal and the complete collapse of grand narratives that itself has the inherent potential to become a grand narrative and in this they also locate certain uh, contradictions and certain paradoxes which are part of the postmodern critiques because since they do not talk about any alternative structures in place there is a possibility that the arguments that they are making the dismissive arguments, the uh, negating arguments or the arguments of refusals that they are making can in turn become grand narratives by itself and the same applies with Foucault, Barth and many others who have uh, spoken about different kinds of realities, different kinds of texts and different kinds of meaning making processes. And there are also particular critics such as Zygmunt Bauman who argues that capitalism has produced this unstable postmodern world and uh, here we also find him in uh, in, in agreement with the Marxist critics 
and he is also extremely critical of Lyotard's idea, which uh, extols as to be free from the tyranny of meta narratives. And uh, Zygmunt Bauman also feels that the sort of a move away from the meta narratives it has another uh, danger associated with it because it denies our capacity as humans to act collectively for the common good. And this can also be tied up with the criticism that Noam Chomsky had that it only promotes a certain kind of a deviant behavior. And um, many of those critics are uh, collectively of the opinion that postmodernism is a middle class intellectual point of view, a luxury that many others cannot afford. For example, it is said to have uh, been suffering from a myopia of the visible because there are certain very visible realities which cannot be rejected no matter what kind of theoretical frameworks that you use. And um, as they would say, just because the world appears more fragmented, it does not mean that there is not a reality out there. They also talk about war situations, about poverty, about different kinds of day-to-day uh, uh, -day turmoils that people are engaging with to talk about how it is impossible to reject reality in totality as the postmodern critics would say. In this lecture, we do not attempt to give an evaluation of either the Marxist uh, criticism or the postmodern theories. We only uh, propose to present certain uh, differing viewpoints which have been in circulation ever since the postmodern theories emerged. It is also important to be alert to to be aware of these different kinds of criticisms which are being leveled against postmodernism, even when we are talking about the various theories, the various uh, theoretical positions and the various uh, conceptual frameworks which are available in terms of postmodernism. What is also especially significant is that though, a different, though different kinds of criticisms have been leveled against postmodernism, especially from the Marxist point of view, we do not find the postmodern critics radically defending their stance or responding to these criticisms in a systematic manner. It is also because most of these uh, critiques, most of these criticisms have also been extremely dismissive of uh, postmodernism. They have not really engaged with particular elements. They have only been dismissing postmodernism for being uh, either depthless or meaningless or uh, being uh, merely nonsensical and passing off as particular kinds of theories and frameworks. As in when we wind up this course, we recall certain discussions that we had about Habermas in the in one of the earliest lectures. Habermas also was one of the vehement critiques, uh, 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 critics of uh, postmodernism. But what uh, distinguishes Habermas from the other line of critics against postmodernism is that Habermas, Habermas was willing to engage with certain postmodern theories. He was willing to engage with particular concepts. He did not encourage a certain dismissive approach towards postmodernism. When we survey Habermas's approaches towards modernity and postmodernity, we know that Habermas was not in favor of the rejection of modernity in totality because he also thought that the project of modernity was yet incomplete and it also needed some more time for uh, it to reach its completion to deliver all of its promises and that postmodernism had taken uh, off uh, uh, even before modernity had completed, even before modernism had completed whatever it had begun. But uh, one of the uh, ways in which Habermas differs from most of the other dominant critics of postmodernism is that he talks about a way in which a postmodern critique can be incorporated into the idea of modernity, how postmodernism, postmodernity can become, can exist as part of, as an extension of modernity. And uh, he also takes postmodernism seriously and does not reject it as a mere nonsense. And he also agrees that the focus of debate should be on modernity as it is realized in social practices and institutions. Unlike many other defenders of modernity and the critics of uh, postmodernism, he is not entirely supporting everything that modernity signaled, everything that modernity uh, stood for. On the contrary, Habermas is willing to engage with the many flaws which are inherent in modernity and move towards an approach, a postmodern approach perhaps, which would also give us the tools to talk about the meta narratives to uh, reject the meta narratives which are not really useful. And in that sense, uh, maybe the postmodern critics have also been willing to engage with Habermas, they have been responding, they have been in dialogue with uh, the many things that Habermas had put forward. So, uh, in order to take a balanced view, perhaps when we talk about the criticisms against postmodernism, it is important for us also to uh, adopt a position uh, which uh, perhaps Habermas uh, exemplifies. Maybe it is important not to accept either of these uh, uh, um, frameworks in totality, 
and it is again important not to dismiss them in totality either because each of these have certain practices which would be useful to understand um, text uh, cultures and context and there are also certain elements which would be which would uh, seem a bit far fetched which would seem a bit difficult to understand difficult to comprehend but at the same time it is important to agree that postmodernism gives us uh, tools gives us frameworks to, to engage with to critique modernity in ways in which in the earlier century in the beginning of the century it was not possible and this sort of a rejection this sort of a refusal of meta narratives this sort of a move away from modernity is also important because it gives a uh, space to alternative articulations it gives rise to it gives uh, visibility to uh, many other practices which were uh, hitherto uh, taboo or hitherto unacceptable it more importantly it gives a more holistic approach a more inclusive approach which is perhaps also the need of the hour so uh, with that positive note we also end this lecture thank you for listening and i look forward to seeing you again in the next session